So we finished talking about the basic examples of spinners in physics. Starting with this video, we're going to start looking at spinners from a purely mathematical point of view, in both 3D space and 4D space time. In this video, we're going to see how we can rewrite a 3D vector as a 2x2 two two matrix called a polyvector. And in the next video, we're going to see how we can factor this polyvector into a pair of poly spinners. Later, we'll see how we can do the same thing for a 4D spacetime vector and factor it into a pair of vial spinners. For the next few videos, we're going to be starting over and inventing spinners from scratch, so you won't actually require any of the previous videos to understand what's going on. However, the previous videos might help give more context for why we care about spinners. I've included a list of sources for this video in the description if you want to learn more. So, writing a vector as a 2x2 two two matrix like this probably looks pretty random, but it turns out that this 2x2 two two matrix is very useful for when we want to do geometric transformations on our vector like reflections and rotations. In order to understand why this form is useful, we need to spend a bit of time talking about the poly matrices, also called the sigma matrices. Later in this video, we'll see how these matrices can help us reflect and rotate vectors. So here are the three poly matrices, sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z. These are also called sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3 in some sources. These matrices have some nice properties that make them useful for doing geometry. First, they have zero trace. Second, they're all Hermitian. Third, they all square to the identity matrix. Fourth, we can always swap the order of two sigma matrices in a product if we include a negative sign. Another way of saying this is saying that the sigma matrices anti-commute. Let's review each of these properties in order. The trace of a matrix is just the sum of the elements along the main diagonal. It's pretty easy to see that each sigma matrix has zero trace. Let's move on to the Hermitian property. Remember, the transpose of a matrix denoted with T just means we flip a matrix's rows and columns. But when matrices have complex entries, we're usually more interested in the Hermitian conjugate, denoted with a dagger symbol. This means that we take the transpose of the matrix and take the complex conjugate of each entry, which flips the sign of each imaginary I. All three sigma matrices are Hermitian, which means they are equal to their own Hermitian conjugates. Both sigma X and sigma Z are real matrices, so we can just take the transpose to see this and ignore the complex conjugate. For sigma Y, we first flip the rows and columns, which exchanges plus i and minus i. Then the complex conjugate flips the plus and minus signs, so we end up back where we started. So all sigma matrices are equal to their own daggers. The third property says that all sigma matrices square to the identity matrix, which I'm going to denote with this fancy number one for this video. I'll show this explicitly for sigma y. The inner product of the first row and the first column gives us plus i times minus i, and since i squared equals negative 1, this is just negative minus 1, or plus 1. The other inner products give us 0, 0, and another plus 1, which is the identity matrix. You can check that sigma x and sigma z also square to the identity matrix. The final property is that, given the product of two different sigma matrices, this product equals the negative of the same two sigma matrices multiplied in the opposite order. I'll show this explicitly for sigma y times sigma z, which gives the components 0, i, i, and 0. If we reverse the product and do sigma z times sigma y, we get the components 0, negative i, negative i, and 0, which is the negative of the result we got before. You can check for yourself that this property also applies to multiplying the other pairs of sigma matrices. 
These last two properties, that sigma matrices square to the identity and anti-commute, can be summarized by this formula. The delta symbol here is called the Kronecker delta, which equals 1 if the i and j indices are the same, and equals 0 if they are different. Basically, if we put the same sigma matrix in for both i and j, both products square to the identity, so we get 2 times the identity. But if the two sigma matrices are different, then the anti-commutative property means the terms cancel to 0. This formula can be shortened even further using this notation, where these curly brackets denote the anti-commutator of two matrices. Now that we've studied the properties of the sigma matrices, we're going to introduce the polyvector form of writing a vector. We normally write a 3D vector V with components X, Y, Z as a linear combination of the basis vectors EX, EY, and EZ, each scaled by the components. What we're going to do now is replace the basis vectors with the three sigma matrices, so that we now have a linear combination of the sigma matrices. If we write the matrices explicitly, multiply in the components and add them together, we get this 2x2 two two matrix. We call this a polyvector, and it's an alternative way of writing a 3D vector. Polyvectors are also traceless, since the individual sigma matrices are traceless. And polyvectors are Hermitian, since each of their individual sigma matrices are also Hermitian. You can also check for yourself that multiplying a poly matrix by itself will give the vector's squared length times the identity matrix. This poly vector might seem strange, but it's very useful for doing geometric transformations such as reflections and rotations. Remember, if we want to reflect our vector along the z-axis, we just leave the x and y components alone and flip the sign of the z component. This basically treats the xy plane as a mirror and reflects our vector, reversing the sign along the z direction. I'm now going to introduce an operation called conjugation. When we conjugate by sigma z, it means we multiply on the left by sigma z and on the right by sigma z inverse. For example, conjugating sigma x by sigma z looks like this. The colors here don't mean anything. They're just to make the formula more readable. However, since sigma z squares to the identity, it is its own inverse, so we can just ignore the inverse symbol here. Since we know the sigma matrices anti-commute, we can flip the order of sigma x and sigma z here and get a negative sign and replace this product of sigma z's by the identity. So we get negative sigma x. Conjugating sigma y by sigma z also gives us negative sigma y. Conjugating sigma z by sigma z just gives us positive sigma z, since there's no swapping needed to simplify. So if we want to reflect a vector along the z-axis, we need to flip the sign of the z component. But here, we've done the exact opposite of that. We've flipped every component's sign except the z component. But this is easy to fix. We just put a negative sign in front of our conjugation. So negative conjugation by sigma z will flip the sign of the z component and leave all the other components alone. Now watch what happens when we take a general polyvector v and negative conjugate by sigma z. We can expand our polyvector as a linear combination of the sigma matrices, and pull all the vector components out in front, since they are just numbers. We know all these negative conjugations leave the x and y components unchanged, and flips the sign of the z component. So we've showed that negative conjugating a polyvector by sigma z will reflect the vector along the z-axis. We can get similar formulas for doing reflections along the x and y axes. It turns out that we can reflect a vector along any direction that we like. We just pick a unit vector u of length 1 pointing in the direction of the reflection, 
and negative conjugate our poly vector v. Remember, since u is a poly vector of length 1, and squaring a poly vector gives its squared length times the identity matrix, u squared should just equal the identity matrix. To see that the reflection actually happens, let's negative conjugate v by a unit vector u. We can break up v into a portion that's parallel with u and perpendicular to u. The parallel part would just be u scaled by some factor k. And for the perpendicular vectors, it turns out we can swap their order if we pick up a negative sign. We can collapse these products to identities and rewrite u times k as the parallel portion of v. So we see that the portion of v that's parallel to u has been reversed, while the perpendicular part has been left unchanged. This is exactly what we want for reflections. To prove this anti-commuting property that we used for perpendicular vectors, you can pause the video and look at these slides. The sigma matrices are also useful for doing rotations of vectors. The key to doing a rotation is understanding that a rotation can be viewed as a pair of reflections. Let's say that we have this flag and reflect it in this mirror, so that the flag is pointing in the opposite direction. Now let's reflect it again in this mirror. The result is just a rotated version of our original flag. So this shows us that a rotation is basically just like two reflections. Also notice that the angle of the flag's rotation is equal to twice the angle between the two mirrors that we used. So if the angle of rotation is theta, then the angle between the mirrors is theta over 2. Let's try reflecting our poly vector once along the x-axis and once along the y-axis to see what we get. Geometrically, reflecting along x and then along y looks like this. It's a 180 degree rotation in the xy plane. This makes sense, since the angle between our mirrors is 90 degrees, and the resulting rotation is twice that, 180 degrees. Let's try doing this algebraically. To reflect along x, we do a negative sandwich with sigma x. To reflect along y, we do a negative sandwich with sigma y. The negative signs cancel. Since we know the sigma matrices are Hermitian, we can add daggers to them without changing anything. We also know from linear algebra that we can replace a product of daggered matrices if we reverse their order and dagger the entire product. So basically, daggering a pair of sigmas is the same as reversing their order. So this is the formula for doing a 180 degree rotation in the xy plane. And if we work through the algebra, we find that the x and y components get reversed, as expected for a 180 degree rotation. Now, just for curiosity's sake, let's see what happens if we try transforming v using a single-sided transformation, instead of a double-sided transformation. If we work through the algebra, we get that the x-y components have been rotated by 90 degrees in the x-y plane. However, the z component has come out wrong, with sigmas that cannot be meaningfully simplified. So, doing a double-sided transformation is required to make all the basis sigmas work out properly. Now, what if we wanted to rotate our poly vector by an arbitrary angle, theta? We would need two mirrors separated by an angle of theta over 2. We could start with reflecting along the x-axis, then use another reflection vector angled at theta over 2 compared to the x-axis. When we do these two reflections, the negative signs cancel, and after distributing, the sigma x squareds become identity matrices, and we can swap the order of these sigmas by changing the sign in front. We can also write the right side term as the Hermitian conjugate of the left side term since the Hermitian conjugate swaps the order of the sigmas. So this is our formula for rotating in the xy plane. You'll notice that I'm using angles of theta over 2 here. 
That's because each side of the transformation will rotate by theta over two, giving us a rotation of theta in total. Keep in mind that if the angle between the mirrors is zero, we just reflect in the same mirror twice, leading to no change, as expected. If I try to calculate this rotation, the algebra between all the sigmas gets pretty tedious. It's easier to write things out as matrices. Looking at this left expression and writing out the matrices, we get this. And we can rewrite the cosines and sines as complex exponentials. The left matrix multiplies the top row of our poly vector by a negative exponential, and the bottom row by a positive exponential. After taking the Hermitian conjugate of the right matrix, we get similar multiplications for the left column and right column of our poly vector. The exponentials next to the z's cancel, and we end up with a complex exponential multiplying our x and y components by a phase of theta. Taking this entry and multiplying things out, the real part is our new x component, and the imaginary part is our new y component. These transformations match exactly what we'd get from a rotation matrix in three dimensions by an angle theta in the xy plane. So our two-sided transformation of our poly vector worked. We can get similar matrices for rotations in the yz plane and zx plane. It turns out that all of these matrices are special unitary 2x2 two two matrices, or SU2 matrices meaning they are all unitary and have determinants of one. As an exercise, you can try proving that all of these matrices are unitary by multiplying them by their Hermitian conjugate and getting the identity matrix. See if you can do it using only the properties of the sigma matrices without writing the matrices explicitly. So poly vectors are rotated by a double-sided transformation of SU2 matrices. Let's see if we can prove this fact definitively. As a starting point, we're going to assume that rotating a poly vector can be done with a double-sided transformation with matrices A and B. We're going to use the properties of poly vectors to deduce what A and B should look like. We already know that poly vectors are Hermitian and have zero trace. But another important property of rotating a 3D vector is that its length will not change after the rotation. So we expect the squared length, x squared plus y squared plus z squared, to be unchanged after rotation. Notice that when we take the determinant of our poly vector, we get z times negative z, minus this times this. And simplifying, this becomes negative x squared minus y squared. So the determinant of our poly vector is the negative of the vector's squared length. So when we rotate our poly vector, its determinant, which is the vector's negative squared length, should not change. Using these three properties, we can deduce the form of the A and B matrices. Since poly vectors are Hermitian, the resulting poly vector after the transformation should also be Hermitian. And remember, the Hermitian conjugate of a product is the product of the individual Hermitian conjugates in the reverse order. Since V equals V dagger, we get this formula. We can use this as a hint to assume that the B matrix should equal A dagger, so our transformation looks like A V A dagger. Next, we want to know that the determinant, or negative squared length, of our poly vector should not change after the transformation. So these two determinants must be equal. If we recall that the determinant of a product is just the product of the determinants, we can cancel the determinant of V on both sides. The transpose does not change the determinant result, so we ignore it. And we can bring the complex conjugate outside. So we end up with the squared magnitude of the determinant of A being 1. This means that the determinant of A can be any complex number with magnitude 1, meaning it's a complex number on the unit circle of the form e to the i theta. 
However, there's an important detail we need to pay attention to with double-sided transformations. Let's try replacing our matrix A with A times a complex phase. The phase on the right will get complex conjugated because of the Hermitian conjugate, causing it to cancel with the phase on the left. The resulting transformation is the exact same as the one before we multiplied by the phase. This means that there are multiple A matrices that lead to the same transformation, all related by different phase factors. So there is a redundancy in the A matrices for doing rotations. We can pick out a specific A matrix by picking the one whose determinant is equal to 1. If A has a determinant of e to the i theta, we can always force its determinant to be 1 by multiplying by a phase of e to the negative i theta over 2. This phase will have no impact on the transformation due to the phase cancellation property of double-sided transformations. So the phase drops out anyway. But we can successfully force the determinant of A to be 1. So, by using the properties of determinants and eliminating the redundancies in the phase, we can say that A has a determinant of positive 1. Finally, since polyvectors have zero trace, the result of the transformation should also have zero trace. When we have the trace of a product of matrices, a theorem from linear algebra tells us that we can cycle the product order bringing the last one and putting it in front. Now, since the trace of V is zero for any possible V, the only way for this trace to be zero is if A dagger A equals the identity matrix times a constant. This can be shown by checking the various cases of V and solving for the matrix entries of A dagger A. Taking the determinant of this formula, we already know from the last step that the determinant of A is 1, so k equals plus or minus 1, meaning A dagger times A equals plus or minus the identity matrix. However, the product A dagger times A is guaranteed to have positive entries along the diagonal. So the only option is that A dagger A equals the identity matrix. In other words, A dagger equals A inverse. The fact that A dagger equals A inverse means that A is a member of the group of 2x2 two two unitary matrices, U2. And the fact that it has a determinant of 1 means it's from the group of 2x2 two two special unitary matrices, SU2, where the word special means the determinant is 1. So what we've shown is, in order to rotate the polyvector by some angle, we do a double-sided matrix transformation like this, with SU2 matrices. This is a direct result of polyvectors being traceless, Hermitian, and having a determinant that's equal to the negative squared length of a vector, which must be unchanged by rotations. Now, what do SU2 matrices actually look like? If we take an SU2 matrix A, with complex entries alpha, beta, gamma, delta, we know that A dagger involves flipping the off-diagonal components and complex conjugating all the entries. We also know that the inverse of any general 2x2 two two matrix will take this form. Since the determinant of an SU2 matrix is 1, we can set this to 1. And since A dagger equals A inverse, we immediately get that delta equals the complex conjugate of alpha, and gamma equals the negative complex conjugate of beta. So all SU2 matrices take this form, where the determinant equals 1, so the squared magnitude of alpha plus the squared magnitude of beta equals 1. The three rotation matrices we saw earlier match this form, so they are indeed SU2 matrices. Also note that SU2 matrices have two complex parameters, or four real parameters. However, since the determinant is forced to be one, this gives one extra constraint, reducing the four real parameters to three real parameters. As there are three independent planes of rotation that we can choose angles for. 
Another thing to notice is that the positive version of an SU2 matrix and the negative version of an SU2 matrix perform the exact same rotation, since the negative signs cancel out in the double-sided transformation. This means that for every 3x3 rotation matrix in the group SO3, there are two corresponding rotation matrices in SU2 that do the same rotation. We'll see later that this means SU2 is the double cover of SO3. So to summarize this video, we saw that the sigma matrices, also called poly matrices, obey these special anti-commutation relations. And this allows them to easily perform geometric transformations on poly vectors. Reflections are performed by doing negative conjugation on a poly vector. And rotations are performed by doing double-sided transformations like this, where these matrices are SU2 matrices. Each of the two matrices performs half the rotation, so we use half angles inside the matrix entries. In the next video, we're going to see how we can factor a poly vector into a pair of poly spinners. Each poly spinner will rotate using only a single SU2 matrix. This is why poly spinners rotate half as much as vectors do, and require two full rotations to get back to their starting point.